And that was one of the common themes that came out of my interviews. Um, and what makes it hard, I think any one of these in, in itself is mind boggling. You put all of them together, right? And just even all three of those Uber sections that I talk about in the book, the um, uh, intelligence, reality, and, and web three, anyone on its own is game changing. You put all three together, it just, it, it kind of uh, boggles your mind. And welcome to a new episode of a Digital Coffee Marketing Brew. And I'm your host, Brett Dystern. And quickly, if you could please just subscribe to this podcast and leave a review. It really does help with the rankings and let me know how I'm doing. But this week, we're going to be talking about branding and brand management and everything you need to know about making sure your brand is tip-top shape with Mitch here with me. He's been on TEDx. He has a lot of years of experience with this. So I'm actually really excited because I always need help with more branding if I can actually get it managed correctly as well. So welcome to the show, Mitch. Uh, great. Uh, it's great to be here, Brett. Thanks for having me on. All right. And the first question is on my guest is, are you a coffee or tea drinker? Uh, coffee. Anything like specific, light, dark, medium? Uh, no, I'm not really a connoisseur. Uh, pro probably lighter. What yourself? Well, it does have the most caffeine, so. Oh, does it really? I didn't even know that. Yes, fun fact. The dark roast has the least and the medium delight has the most. I didn't know that. Interesting. And, uh, yeah. And I gave a brief explanation about your expertise. Can you give our listeners a little bit more about what you do? Yeah. So I am a brand strategy consultant. Um, I have about 30 years of uh, 30 plus years of experience in, in brand and marketing strategy. Started my career in brand management with Unilever and then Coca-Cola. And then um, in the last 20 plus years or so, I've been consulting, but in those same topic areas of brand and marketing strategy. So I do positioning, brand architecture, brand experience, things like that. Um, more on the strategy side of branding, if you will. And um, I have my own firm, Full Surge, and have my second book coming out um, next week, uh, actually week after next, May 14th, um, called The Future Ready Brand. Gotcha. So how does a brand become future ready? Well, in the book, I talk about um, three different, or really two uh, different areas, and they kind of impact a third. So there are societal trends that I think marketers need to be very aware of and also technological. So on the societal trends or forces, as I call them in the book, there is um, transparency, transparency and purpose, uh, health and wellness, changing attitudes towards health and wellness, and then the emergence of Gen Z. So those are kind of in this, what I'm calling societal bucket. And then there's uh, technological, which include um, uh, AI, machine learning, predictive analytics, and then uh, extended reality, so AR, VR, metaverse, and then Web3, which would include things like web, uh, um, sorry, blockchain, uh, tokenomics, NFTs, and so forth. And then those technologies and societal trends and preferences are impacting everything from content marketing to gamification, influencer marketing, and so forth. So it's really through attention to those societal trends and forces, if you will, um, and, and how best to deal with them and, and leverage them for to your advantage that uh, you know therein lies the secret to being future ready. Mm. But how, I mean, I get what you're saying about societal, but how do you really become ready? Because everything shifts so quickly in the society, it seems like it, it probably takes a while. We just don't, aren't aware of it until it's like a completely sweeping trend where businesses are like, I didn't know what I said was wrong. Yeah, well, again, I think in that department, it, it, there's certainly, um, it, it, there's the, the entire chapter I wrote about purpose. I think that's a key one. Just understand, I, I think um, purpose is, is has been very, uh, very popular, very top of mind for a while, but it only seems to be getting stronger or more intense. And I think a lot of that is being driven by the younger generations. Uh, which as a rule tend to be a little bit more purpose-driven, cause-motivated, if you will. Um, so I think, you know, that's certainly a starting point, right? You just understand, you know, uh, do you as a company, as a business have a purpose? 
ideally you do. Ideally, it's something more than just making money, right? Because that's not what, what purpose is about, uh, even though that's a valid goal. Um, and, and then deciding, again, what role does that have with your brand or your brand? So just because you are purpose-driven doesn't mean you have to define your brand by it, your brand positioning. But if you do, it's all the more important to activate in a way that's very consistent with that purpose. A little bit of pushback is just that, I mean, younger generations, they're so fickle about their purpose that one day one is their purpose, the next day another one's their purpose. I mean, how do you do, how do you define that balancing point? Because like I said, younger generations, I remember when I was younger, like everything like swung so severely where I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing right now. Yeah, I, I I would I understand what you're saying. I would argue if that's the case, it's not really a purpose as we're defining it. It might be, it might be a cause. It might be an interest, right? But purpose is something that's pretty deep seated. It's usually pretty ingrained in your DNA, and um, it, it's something that doesn't tend to sh- change easily over time. I'm not saying it won't ever change, and your purpose is your purpose for your whole life. But it's not something that kind of comes and goes. Uh, if it does, I would argue it's probably not a purpose. In, in the truest sense. That's fair. And I mean, is there any other like emerging trends that you've seen in 2024 for like managing your brand or making your brand future ready, as you said? Is there anything that marketers and PR pros should like really understand and utilize right now? Yeah. So I think, um, I think a lot of those lie in that middle section of the book that I talked about under the tech emerging technologies. I, I think. Some of those emerging technologies, some aren't even emerging anymore. They're here, like AI, right? That, that, that's, <laughs> that's arrived. Uh, it probably arrived a little quicker than maybe we had thought. Um, some of the other technologies that I talk about in the book, um, extended, the extended reality-related ones and Web3, I think are a little bit slower in developing, but, but certainly on the near horizon. So I, yeah, I think uh, embracing those technologies, uh, just understanding what their potential is for marketing, you, you know, a lot of the CMOs that I spoke with, um, I thought made great points about, look, you don't need to become a data scientist, right? That, that's the last thing in the world you need to do, right? But you need to know, you need to befriend your CIO, right? And you need to understand what the potential is of these technologies and how they can be used in the field of marketing to achieve a competitive advantage. And a lot of them talked about, um, several of them, especially in B2B um, environments, about how these technologies can help really elevate the entire stature of, of the marketing function and elevate the role of the CMO in the C-suite, which I think is, is pretty powerful, um, especially AI. Gotcha. I mean, I mean, I would almost postulate that web three is actually ai and the blockchain more than it is nfts and crypto i think crypto and nfts are part of it but i think web three is really going to be ai and the blockchain specifically because those are more disruptive things that we've seen i mean ai is every ai is everywhere everybody's trying to use it everybody's trying to figure it out heck i've gotten two uh, utenomy classes just to figure out how to use it well yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think another, I, I think a lot of this is just uh, definitional, but um, so, some of the CMOS I spoke with kind of talked about how, and I think it's, it's simplistic and, and maybe not 100% accurate, but almost like the, the Web3 is kind of the back end, if you will. It is the, the foundation or the scaffolding, if you will, and the extended reality in the metaverse is the, the front end, the experience, how, how we as consumers or website visitors or what have you, you know, experience a lot of that technology, but um, you know, Web three is, is is I think huge, right? It really has very profound implications for um, how how data is going to be used uh, in the future. For, you know, in, in terms of um, you know privacy and, and data ownership, and and therefore uh, really kind of reshape the relationship uh, that that can, that companies and brands have with consumers. Right, They're, it's going to be a much more direct model. You know, they talk a lot about it, kind of inter, uh, eliminating the intermediary, right? Which today are like Google and Facebook uh, and Amazon. Do you think that there's going to be other in- intermediaries we don't know about yet? Because I mean, right now we know of Meta, Google, and Amazon, 
but there could be other ones emerging that we just don't know yet because i mean there's like 50 different like ai things you could use i've have i've got like four or five that i use for my podcasting stuff alone so could there be emerging like intermediary intermediaries that we just don't know about yet yes and yeah it could be um I mean, the, 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 the notion is that, or the, the, the theory is that Web3 will kind of take, will eliminate the need for, for, um, for intermediaries, right? So in, in, uh, kind of relieve the need for Google or uh, Facebook, for, for instance, to serve in that role, right? And where they hold all the data and you're accessing through their, their accounts and so forth. Um, some experts say they'll that there'll just be other metaverse slash web three intermediaries stepping in. Um, that's not the, the the idea, right? I think the idea, at least in theory, is that blockchain technology relieves the need for that um, and allows for a more direct one on one and private and secure relationship, right? Where people are going to feel consumers are going to feel comfortable. You know, handing over their data to those who they want to have it, right? And not to those they don't and not having to, you know, have a broker, uh, if you will. Mm. So is it almost like the brand for the future could be almost like the broker of individual data in itself saying, trust us to give us your data and we'll protect it through the blockchain or whatever else comes along. Yeah. I, I, I think that's the idea again, that it is, it is more direct now. Um, it is more of an opt in, if you will, where, um, there's you, you it's it's not necessarily like selling through advertising right and you know buying buying facebook ads or buying google search ads or what have you it's you know it's consumers kind of opting in saying hey i like you as a brand and i am going to give you my information and you're going to reward me right through blockchain related assets nfts etc all right it's just it's more of a again th this is the theory as i understand it and you know as i talk about my book i'm not i am by no means an expert on any of these technologies i um i speak to them from a brand and marketing perspective and largely through third hand right i, I talk to marketers i talk to 43 the cmos or 43 global cmos mostly fortune 500 in writing this book and yeah, I'm kind of relaying their perspectives, their projections in some cases, you know, and overlaying my own interpretation on top of it. But um, in theory, that that's how it will work, right? Uh, whether it does or not, I don't know. I, I, I think there's a lot of analogies drawn back to the early days of dot com, right? The um, uh, early 2000s. And, you know, there were a lot of theories and projections about how the whole data, uh, the whole digital transformation would unfold. And some of that came true, other, others of it didn't, right? And I think it's similar here. We, we can only conjecture at this point. Agreed. I mean, we're just postulating because Web3, like you said, is taking a little bit longer time to actually build out because from my understanding, like the past two years, everybody's talking about Web3 is cryptocurrency and NFTs and and blockchain as well. And that didn't work out as well as people thought it would. NFTs like completely crashed and no one, and they were almost worthless. And then crypto hit pretty, was hit pretty hard. It's back up now, but it got hit pretty hard. And everybody's like, well, I don't like this Web3 reality. Yeah. And, and, and I think it does. It, it, it really, you have to kind of get into the finer details. There's, um, there's cryptocurrency, right? And then there are like NFTs more broadly, which are you know, digital assets. Um, and then there's kind of the notion, at least as I understand it, is you know you, the primary market and then secondary markets. And the primary, I think, you know that that's certainly where um, brands are and companies are, are rewarding consumers directly, right? And I think that has the potential to to have stickiness i think when you start getting into secondary markets for nft assets and you start getting into cryptocurrency that's where a lot of the skepticism and the questions and, and where i think things could could very easily go wrong right but again just opinion of one agreed and so i mean how do marketers like manage their brands right now because you said societal changes but also technology changes i mean i feel like we're in an inflection point right now because of ai because of gen z emerging as 
more adults, they're in college and everything. So how do they manage this inflection point? Because it's massive changes and it's hard for one person to keep up a lot of times. It's, in, it's incredibly difficult. Um, and that was one of the common themes that came out of my interviews. Um, and what makes it hard, I think any one of these in, in itself is mind boggling. You put all of them together, right? And just even all three of those Uber sections that I talk about in the book, the um, uh, intelligence, reality, and, and Web3, e, e, anyone on its own is game changing. You put all three together, it just, it, it kind of uh, boggles your mind. But, um, you know, the the advice I was hearing and and basically the plan that I think a lot of the CMOs I spoke with are following. I mean, so, there, there's a spectrum, right? Some are much more advanced. I think some of the European CMOs I spoke with are just, if I were to uh, generalize, are a little bit further along the technology path than their U.S. counterparts. But one common theme, I think, is um, is, is gavel, right? Test and learn, experiment. Uh, don't just sit on the sidelines and wait, right? It's very tempting to say, you know what? There's just a lot of uncertainty. I'm going to wait and see how this all shakes out. I'm going to wait and see how this technology evolves or doesn't evolve. I'm going to wait and see which metaverse platform is the winner, if there is, in fact, one single winner, right? And that's probably not the best way to go. Uh, you, you have to kind of jump in cautiously and and, um, and wisely, right? Don't be careless, but the CMOs I'm talking about, even the ones that aren't quite as far along in the learning curve, they're doing something, right? And they're they're lear they're testing and learning, uh, even if it's on a small scale, because they think that they will. They're not behind the, the learning curve now, right? They're, it's not a, a disadvantage for them now, but if if they wait too long on the sidelines, they will be sooner than later. So I think that's some of the advice that I got. Um, and that they're following and that, that I would convey to you is just, you know, and it's, uh, some of these, especially the AI ones, the, 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 uh, the barrier to entry is so low, right? I mean, the technology is, is very accessible, very inexpensive. Um, most of it, especially the generative AI, but really all AI, all AI, especially ones that aren't necessarily custom or proprietary. I mean, th those are things that you could be doing today and understanding what their capabilities are, what what sort of advantages do they do they offer a brand? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've tested out Gronk, which is Twitter's own thing, or X. I've tested out Perplexity, which is actually pretty good for researching. Claude, Claude actually has some pretty good uh, prompts that they've put on, on their own website, and then obviously Chat GPT. I've tested out as well, so. I mean, we talk about the metaverse, but I mean, you ask any gamer, we're not, gamers are not on board with the metaverse right now. <laughs> we shy away from it. We're like, nah, this is, this is, this is, we don't really like this too much. VR is trying to catch hold, but it's still not there yet. So, I mean, would you say that for marketers, testing out AI would probably be the first step and then kind of wait and see for the metaverse to, like figure it all out because if gamers are on board on the virtual world, it's not going to catch on quite yet. So a couple of things, I, I think in general, yes, I, I, I think the priority by far and away is AI over metaverse. Let's say, um, first of all, I think the, the, um, they both obviously have a lot of potential, but I think the AI is, uh, potential to disrupt in a positive way is, is far greater, certainly at this point. Right. So, uh, if, if you're only going to look at one of those two now um, and you're not doing either, I, I, I would say certainly AI. But even regarding metaverse, um, what I learned through some of my discussions, at least, is, you know, just let's tease apart some of these definitions, right? There's there's the metaverse, which is a place and a concept, and then there's the extended realities, right, which are the um the, the tools, right, and the enabling technologies. And in, there's a lot of cases where um, things like virtual reality that are very often associated with the metaverse, I mean, they have application outside of metaverse. Um, augmented reality is being used today very heavily in a lot of different environments, not the least of which retail, right? The overlaying technology onto physical environments. Again, that's not metaverse. Um, 
And then the other thing I would say about, so, so there's that point. And then the other thing about metaverse is, um, and some of the CMOs called it, I'm not sure how universal this term is, but they refer to it as they're, they're, they're in web 2.5, right? Between web two and three. And what that is, is, um, it's like, an Oculus metaverse, right? That there, if there's advantages to be having a presence in the metaverse, even if it's not the fully immersive virtual reality experience. So that's, and, and, and they're, they're in there, right. In, in that way. So there's, there's, it, it's just not kind of an easy answer, right? There's, there's different variations and different degrees, um, to embracing the technology. And um, it, it's 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 not an all or nothing. It's not a one size fits all. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I think you, I mean we talk about the metaverse, but also Epic is kind of building their own through Fortnite with virtual concerts. I think that has a bigger disruption inflection point than metaverse right now because I think I, was, I think a few weeks ago I saw like Billie Eilish is going to have a character on there. Kiss is going to be doing their virtual conf conferences they have lego now they just announced i think today lego star wars is going to be a part of it so i think there are different ones you have metaverse you have epic something steam valve which is a big uh gaming distribution it's like the biggest one they have their own like vr type thing but i do agree with you that the ar section of it which i always like more is 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 what we should be looking at more because you have Apple Vision Pro, but that's still too expensive. It's $3,500. I don't know how many people have $3,500 to just throw down. And it looks weird when you see people in public use it. You're like, uh, I don't know about this type of a thing. So would we say for like marketers to test out AR first and then let VR or whatever virtual worlds kind of like play themselves out? Because I don't see really like a, an emergence of... I see a few companies doing it, but I don't see a leader quite yet. Yeah, you know, I think it potentially, I think it really depends on the, first and foremost, the, the nature of your business, right? Um, you know, are you B2B, are you B2C, regardless, you know, how experiential uh, or how immersive does the experience need to be or can be? Uh, I think those have implications. What are your competitors doing? So I don't think it's, there's one answer to that question. Um, maybe as a generalization, you could be right. Um, but, you know, I, and I think even the, the virtual reality in the metaverse, um, as much as we think about that, you know, a lot of times that's synonymous with gamers, as you referenced earlier. And, um, you know, but I talked to a lot of B2B um, client or uh, CMOs, you know, including in professional services, right? You can't really get further away from a quote unquote gamer. And they're talking about how they believe virtual reality will impact their business. And they could envision, uh, you know, conduct, uh, c conducting business in a, in a hybrid virtual and real world, right? Where they're, they're conducting meetings and some people are live and some are, are virtual and yet it's almost impossible to distinguish between the two. I mean, I know it's hard to get your head around, but this is what they're, they're talking about. And this, this is not gaming, right? This is, you know, this is everyday real world uh, business and commerce. So th that's what I said. It's, it's, it's really hard to, to give a, a blanket answer to that. It's really more about what's suit, what's most appropriate for your, your uh, industry and, and kind of what suits your company and, and your goals. Agreed. I think I Google had something for virtual conferences that made you look 3D. The technology seemed like it was progressing and you didn't have to have as much of their expensive stuff to actually make it work, but you still had to have like a very specific like webcam to make yourself look 3D or like in the room. So I agree with you that there's some aspects of, I guess, the virtual world or metaverse or whatever that is very applicable. applicable Apple, well, can be used for businesses. Apparently I can't say the word, but can be used for businesses like that, like teleconferencing, making you feel like you're in the room instead of a flat screen like we're in right now. You know, I had a, yes. And I had an interesting conversation with um, financial services, uh, a, a, a banking CMO, and we, we were talking about metaverse and like, well, why, why would you ever need to be in a metaverse? And, and why would anybody ever want to conduct 
banking transactions with an avatar. And, and she said, well, think about, think about this, think about somebody who is looking to apply for a loan, right? And they're a minority, a person of color, what have you, and they're concerned that they're going to be uh, discriminated against. And all of a sudden they have an avatar, right? Which doesn't necessarily give away their, your know, aspects of their identity that they'd rather not reveal. You know, all of a sudden you're just saying, yeah, wow, I never really thought about that. So the, there, I just think there's a lot of stuff we don't know, right? And a lot of applications and implications that this technology has that um, might make it more relevant than we uh, foresee and perhaps even sooner than, than we might think. Yeah, when I thought that, yeah, why, why, why would you care about an avatar in, in banking, right? But, okay. I mean, what is it? Wells Fargo and Chase have their own, like, chat or AI things now through their apps that you could use to send money to people. I think, or it was a Bank of America in Wells Fargo. It was one of the big ones that were basically using AI to do a bunch of different tasks through your voice. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. I spoke with, uh, to, with, with Wells Fargo, um, yeah, and Ally Bank. So th I, I did speak with a couple of, um, of uh, financial services companies, and th they actually were some of the further ones along the the um, the XR metaverse than than others who you might have thought would be. And so, like pivoting onto like, how can you protect your brand right now? I mean, for example, <laughs> the colleges have been kind of hampered by a bunch of protests and. One side is very upset that they allowed the encampments. The other side's like, why don't you allow the encampments? So, I mean, that's just an example. But how do you protect that brand and manage that brand to keep it at its reputation? Because like one false step and you lose all your reputation or quite a bit, most of it. Uh, yeah, and I think that's true with anything. I mean, we saw what happened with Bud Light and in the influencer space. I mean, that's, you know, nothing nothing to do with technology per se, but um, one, that's just kind of the, the nature of marketing. But yeah, I do think that there are things that, that can be done to protect your brand um, in, in w with technology, especially AI. There's a, there's a lot of uh, your tools that uh, are, they, they guard against um, offensive, certainly offensive things, right? Uh, put, putting out content that is offensive in some way. Uh, there's even more sophisticated tools. Uh, there's way, there's custom tools that allow you to take um, an off the shelf GPT like chat GPT and customize it or train it over time so that it represents your brand point of view and your brand voice and personality, right? And it's truer to your brand. So yeah, so there are things I think both on the front end that you can do to to, to increase your all re relevance, and on the back end to uh, protect your brand. But um, you know, one of the um, another common theme along these lines that came across in these interviews is you just you can't turn your brand over to technology, right? Techn these technologies, as potent as they are, they're enablers. They're very powerful tools that, when used right, can really yield a competitive advantage, but they're not turnkey. They're not standalone. They are, as one of the CMOs I spoke with, they're an amplifier to human creativity, right? They do things that humans can't do. Humans can do things that it doesn't do as well. And it's when you bring the two together that you have power. And I think part of that topic you're talking about, like brand protection and brand safety, for the foreseeable future, it's going to be in the hands of the marketer you know, to the extent that they can. I mean, like I always say, I've talked to a bunch of marketers and they've said the same thing, like use it as a tool or your assistant or an intern, like a virtual intern or whatever, but don't make it your boss of everything where you just kind of let it do its course. You'd never oversee it. Yeah. And you wouldn't, well, and that goes for anything, right? I mean, when you're creating ads, do you turn it over to your agency and you know, say, hey, we're looking forward to seeing the ad commercial on air? No, you, you, Nothing works that way, right? You have to have oversight on on everything uh, th that you're doing proactively, and and this technology is, is no is no different, right? I think the temptation is, wow, it's 
And, you know, the I in AI is intelligence, right? So it's got to be right and it's got to be good. And, you know, I, I should be able to just turn it. But, but no, you can't, right? We, we all know that uh, there are data integrity problems. There are uh, a lot of times these um, models have systemic biases that might be subtle and we're unaware of. So it always requires, I think, that that oversight. And so people are listening to this podcast and they're wondering where they can, where can they find you online to maybe to learn more about brand management, maybe to learn more about your future, the future of branding, or how to get your book. So again, the name of my firm is Full Surge, F-U-L-L-S-U-R-G-E. So my website is fullsurge.com. And there's information about the consultancy as well as the, the book and my previous book, The Indispensable Brand. Uh, both of them are on my website. And then also available on Amazon and and uh, virtually all other um, retailers. All right. Any final thoughts for listeners? I, I think just you know have fun. You know, kind of dis, uh, suspend disbelief and and like the CMOs were telling me that they're doing. And I mentioned earlier is you know just experiment. Right. I mean, you go in uh, eyes wide open. Go in certainly. Don't be careless. Um, and, and make foolish decisions that can't be reversed, but you, you have to start kind of playing with some of these technologies and, and seeing what potential they have and, and how they can impact your job and, and your business and your brands. All right. Thank you, Mitch, for joining uh, Digital Coffee Marketing Brew and sharing your knowledge on uh, branding, brand management. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it, Brett. And thank you for listening. As always, please subscribe to Digital Coffee Marketing Brew on all your favorite podcasting apps with a five-star review. Really just help with the rankings, let us know how we're doing. And join me next week as I'm talking to a great thought leader in the PR industry. All right, guys, stay safe. Get to understanding how you can future proof your brand and manage your brand. And see you next week. Later.